And would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And item number three is roll call. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Katerina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. And Council Chair Holbrook? I am here, I suppose. <laughs> so item number four is general public comments. Please rise and head to the podium. You state your name, address, and you do have three minutes. My name is Mike Doyle. I live on Shady Lane in Falmouth. I own FalmouthToday.me. And the last time I was here, I was told that I was out of order. And tonight I'm going to uh, go over some information that I have. Uh, currently, the uh, town of Scarborough and the council are being sued by me in federal court for violating the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. And last time I was here, we had random members of the council yelling at me that I was out of order. Will that take place again tonight, uh, Chair Lady? Will that take place again? I'd like to get some information about how Michael Mayetta was emotionally abused when he was forced out of the You're, police department. Mr. Doyle, you are out of order. Okay, there now are I would no like to have specifications state. of why I'm out you of order. You are out of order. Specify, okay. please. Please have a seat. I'm asking for specifications. I've, I've ruled you out of order. I've, I've, I've asked I you to have I don't even know what part of the rule I've violated. I'm asking you to please have a seat. I'm asking for specification. I, can I have his removal, please? Mr. Doyle, please. It, it's Council Chair's prerogative to have... I'm asking which rule I violated. It is her prerogative to have you leave the, the chambers. I'm asking for you to tell me which rule I violated. I'll give you one last chance, and we're going to have you escorted out. I'm asking for the rule I violated. It is Council Chair's prerogative, period. I understand that, but which rule? Yes. Absolutely. Your name is? Sergeant Barr. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak during general public comments? Good evening. My name is Larry Hartwell. I live at 9 Puritan Drive. I um, have some observations about our second reading and the adoption of the school uh, department's validation budget. Uh, it gives me no pleasure to be to uh, say the. Can I? Can I? I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, we didn't quite catch your address. She needs it for the Nine record. Nine Puritan Drive. Thank you very much. Okay. It gives me no pleasure to say the following, but I believe it to be both true and necessary. I was surprised by both the lack of relevant information presented to the council and the lack of discussion on matters that should be considered during such deliberations. Why was key financial information absent both in form and discussion? I was surprised that the town finance department's prepared tax rate computation sheets were not in the town council online agenda. These sheets present the key information to answer what should be basic council questions. What was the 2015 budget? What is the proposed 2016 budget? What are the dollar changes? What's the percentage increase? And oh, what's the impact on the tax rate? All information that's on those sheets. Um, not only was this basic and critical information missing, I don't recall much in the way of discussion of these areas by the council. As I said, we were not presented with a 2015 budget. Without that information, we cannot even answer the basic question, what is the proposed increase in dollars and what's the percentage increase from last year? A basic budget question. Mm -hmm. This would have been a much more meaningful discussion had that occurred. What, um, what the discussion is, uh, revolved around was the as proposed amounts and new proposed amounts that were on the sheets. Uh, how many people, including the council member, knew that the as proposed amounts represent an incomprehensible increase of nearly 13%? <coughs> the new proposed represent an approximate increase of 8%, which is what we voted on. One more point about the financial presentation. Of all the descriptions and amounts um, of the changes are accurate, I doubt that few people could tell that out of the, the $1.7 million shown as decreases, 
that the school board provided at least 1.5 million of that. Um, and they did that throughout a two month period. They came in with, an, with initial estimates. They refined those. Um, and with like actual numbers such as the health insurance premiums, the cost of the one-on-one -on -one computer program that they finalized, and the state covering the cost of chartered schools. When you take into consideration that a quarter of a million dollars of revenue that the finance committee added to the school department budget, you could come to the conclusion that they made no net cuts in a nearly $47 million proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak during general public comments? All right, seeing none, I will close the general public comments. On to item number five, which is the minutes of the June 3rd regular meeting, and is there a motion? So moved. Second. And any errors, omissions, discussion? Mm -hmm. And saying none, all those in favor, and that is unanimous. Item number six is adjustments to the agenda. Um, at this <coughs> time, we do have order number 15-054, which we would like to add to the end of the budget, right after order number 15, uh, after the budget. I wonder what I'm thinking about tonight. After <laughs> order number 15-053, which will be to set move approval on the request to set the date, time, and location of the school budget validation referendum, as noted on the warrant. Um, I will need to um, have a motion to adjust the agenda. So is there a motion? So moved. Second. And any discussion about adding this item to our agenda? And seeing none, all those in favor? And so that item will be added at the end of new business. Item number seven is treasurer's warrants, which I will do later in the meeting, and right into our first one, which is order number 15-047, act on the names posted to the various committees' boards at the June 3rd, 2015 town council <coughs> meeting as recommended by the appointments committee. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? And seeing none, I will close comment and pleasure of the council. So moved. Second. And any discussion? And I'd just like to say um, thank you very much for offering your time um, to, to serve your community on one of our committees. It's greatly appreciated. And with that, all those in favor, and that is unanimous. On to new business. Order number 15-048 is first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the proposed FY 2016 school budget. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? Please rise and, and head up to the podium. You can state your name, address, and you have three minutes. Hello, my name is Betsy Gleistein. Um, I am from 14 Long Meadow Road. Um, as I said last time I stood here, um, it's not easy to be up here. Uh, you wonder if your friends and neighbors think you're, you're anti-education. Um, last time I was here, a position I voiced in multiple public forums was actually called uh, morally reprehensible. Um, so there's no joy in standing up here. And I think probably most people here would agree there's no joy in a no vote. But sometimes the citizenry has to say stop. We're here now and we have to find a way forward. I urged the board last time I was here to put the laptop initiative out for voter referendum. The laptop proposal was controversial and deserved its own place on the ballot. Instead, the town council and the school budget decided they did not trust the voters of Scarborough to understand the laptop request. As a matter of fact, that was stated three times publicly by an elected official, although I don't believe anything malicious was meant by these comments. Voters were left with no way to vote yes for the school budget and no for the laptops. Ironically, voting no for the school budget does not stop the laptops, and the confusion <coughs> around this still abounds. But I lay that squarely at your feet, the town council, and I urge you to reconsider funding these laptops only through voter, vote, voter referendum. Trust the voters of Scarborough to know what is best. I also urge the board to clearly de delineate the school debt payments from the school operating budget for the voters. We need to have a serious discussion if we do that about the long-term capital projects um, ahead of us. <coughs> we have a structure that has six physical school buildings and other 
buildings and all that entails. Um, it's nice to have really nice buildings, but I think almost all parents and people would agree that uh, we want to have quality instruction and programs. Let's talk about the long-term capital plan in ways that make sense, including raising funds for them like Yarmouth did for their, their, comp, their athletic compound that you can go and see the granite uh, plaques thanking the people that helped raise those funds. We can't keep coming back to the taxpayers for some of these things. Um, I would also urge you to pass a non-binding resolution asking the school board not to use contact information given to them for school purposes to advocate for a specific position on a referendum. I know you may not be able to stop that, but I would ask you to pass a non-binding referendum. I personally received three emails and one phone call urging me to take a specific position on uh, a referendum. I understand get out the vote. That's great. That makes sense. Um, I don't think it's right to use information I've provided provided to the schools specifically to contact me about uh, my child and emergency situations for that. Um, I also urge the board to start to form a budget advisory committee made up a diverse group of Scarborough residents, both diverse in ideas, demographics, geography, and <coughs> let's start in October and November. Let's don't start in April and May. Let's start then with this budget advisory committee. Um, I urge you to look at the uh, Falmouth Town budget. Uh, excuse me, just you are out of time, so okay. if I just wrap up. All right. I urge you to look at the Falmouth School Town budget. Um, it's very clear and it answers many questions pro proactively. And finally, I, I urge you to put the entire town budget to a vote. I know the process would be difficult and you would have to work that out, but I feel it's time in Scarborough. We understand since we keep voting down the school budget, we, under, we need to understand are people saying no to the school budget or is this the only way they have to say no to the overall budget? <laughs> it's time to find that out with a vote. Nope, there's no joy in a no vote, but we can learn from it and work together. Thank you for your time. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. I'm fighting a cold. My name is Jacqueline Perry. I reside at 215 Black Point Road. I am a, me a member of the Board of Education, and I'd much rather be at that softball game in Standish than standing here with you. You have a daunting task. And when the council is finished, I, along with my fellow board members, will have to do the slice and dice. Not something I am looking forward to, but it's our job and we will do the best we can. I don't want this to divide our town. We have rights and responsibilities. Webster's Dictionary defines <coughs> right, short version, as something to which one has just claim, the power or privilege to which one is justly entitled. A responsibility is moral, legal, or mental accountability. Students have the right to a free and appropriate public education. School boards are legally, morally, and mentally responsible to see that our students receive that education. I am passionate about providing our students with the skills and the tools they need to be successful in their world. Our future, they certainly are. And I want my Social Security check to keep on coming. Our taxes have risen, but so is everything else. Gas, oil, food, clothing, tuition. I went to the University of Maine at Orono in 1955 and it cost me $300 a year for tuition. Not today. I bought my house in 1970. It listed for $15,500. It is now assessed at about $200,000. I certainly will not sell it for fifteen five. dollars Would you? Some say that our schools are causing them to move out of town. 
Please tell me where you will go to find a tax rate as good as ours along with our amenities. People complain about teachers' salaries. Here are some facts, and you might want to write these down. They are facts. Starting in Scarborough for the current school year, the salary was 32948 Cape Elizabeth statistics are not available for this year, but in 2013, their starting salary was 36158 That was a year ago. Same thing for Yarmouth, a year ago, $35,300. <coughs> for the current year, South Portland starting salary is $35,816, and Cumberland is 38374 Why do we constantly have to have the lowest salaries in the area? So, what do we have to do without slinging mud? The voters will do what they have to do, the board will do what we have to do, and alas, the students who have no say at all will be the big losers. And just a friendly reminder, we do have the kind of green light go, yellow light slow down, and, and red light steer your three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, I'll talk fast. <laughs> Chris Chiazzo, 17 Elmwood Avenue. Um, as you guys deliberate the reductions in the school budget, I wanted to take the opportunity yet again to thank my fellow board members and town council for the cooperative and collaborative manner in which we've conducted the budget process this year. Regardless of whether you supported or opposed the budget, as elected officials and citizens, I trust we can all agree that a collaborative process is much better for our town than a combative one. As you consider what adjustments to make to the budget this evening, I'm confident you will again move forward in the same spirit of collaboration. We spent long hours together discussing what the school budget, represent, school budget represents and what it does not. Based on the budget you approved and sent to the voters, the majority of you agreed that the budget we initially presented was both necessary to move the district forward and continued little excuse me, and contained little in the area of improvements. In fact, we all agreed during the initial budget deliberations the difference between the level services budget, that is, what it would take to keep everything as it was this year and avoid layoffs and a reduction in programs, and the status quo budget, which included investments to keep the district moving forward, ended up being approximately $245,000. So what's changed in terms of the structure of the budget since that time? We've heard that the state budget has passed, and we can count on some additional revenue from the state in terms of added GPA revenue. We've been cautioned by the DOA, however, not to make our own assumptions as to what that increase will be, but wait for the budget to first become law, a process that is an unfortunate consequence of the political struggles in Augusta. As you are all aware, the school is restricted by law to spend only that which is approved by the voters. What that means is whether the state aid is increased by a dollar or a million dollars, we can't access those funds during the fiscal year. In, case, in such a case, those funds would revert to the fund surplus and would be available for use during the next fiscal year. The voters have rejected our collective reasoning and determined that they could not support a budget at that level. Regardless of how you voted, as citizens, we must all respect that process and accept the outcome. As informed elected officials, I know we can count on you as counselors to base your decisions on facts as presented and not on political rhetoric. rhetoric excuse me. I know you'll be mindful of the fact that your decisions impact not only the school, but the town as a whole. As a board, we must accept, accept the outcome of tonight's decision, and I promise you we will do our utmost to limit the impact on the students we've sworn to advocate for. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak on this item? Hi, I'm Stacy Newman. I live at 17 Windsor Pines Drive with my three children, husband, puppy, and a couple chickens, <laughs> depending on the fox. I've been thinking long and hard about how to address you, considering the vote of no with the budget. I thought of re reading you an email my friend wrote me about how she's now looking to move to Falmouth and Cape because she's not sure she wants to ride the schools or the property values all the way down into the toilet. I myself have considered that a lot, but I keep coming back to what brings me to Scarborough, and that's what makes this voting process so upsetting, and it's because of the nastiness that occurred. 
We all know there's been misinformation. There's been signs of pigs vomiting addressing our elected school board and members. And there's been discussion. I've sat through a lot of these meetings, not even with the school board, but about places to build. And I've heard references from the audience and from town council members referring to people moving in and saying, well, that's good, they won't be a burden on our school system. And I thought, is that what our children are? Are they little burdens wearing backpacks going to school? We can't think of them that way. This is Scarborough. These are the kids. These are our kids. We don't want to drive the budget to the ground so there's no more little burdens, no more school, no more budget to fund. That can't be where we end up. And so I've decided that what I can ask you is to, tell, is to ask you to think about what exactly you're going to cut, what that's going to be in practical terms. We know the budget was level spending, and I know that you didn't take this job for the money, probably not for the glory, but because you care about the town of Scarborough, and I know that that means you care about our little burdens just as much as you care about all the people, the retirees, the beachfront owners, the regular families. And so when you consider cutting, I ask you to do so only as necessary, and with each cut, think what exactly that will mean. Thank you. And anybody else wish to speak on this item? My name is still Larry Hartwell, and I still live at 9 Puritan <laughs> Drive. Um, we had, had a great turnout in our town. Maybe it was low, but compared to certainly the other towns, uh, we had a large turnout. Um, then we had the... the um, the informal, yeah, low, high, and, and just right on the budget. So it was split three ways, and yet 56% of the voters said it was too high. This is also the third year in a row that it's been voted down. Um, you need to take this into consideration. Um, your job is to set the bottom line. So I've heard tonight, I couldn't believe the statement that that isn't our job. The school board comes up with a budget, they figure out where to spend it. You determine how much they spend. Then they determine what they're going to do with that. That's your job to do. I just say, oh, well, we're just going to pass it, and it's going out to the, the, uh, the voters. We can't then write in a number. You're responsible for that. It's, I believe, the most important thing that you have to do as a, as a counselor is to determine what the what the tax rate is going to be, what, how much money is going to be spent in this town. Um, some statistics I wasn't going to throw in here, but having heard some certain, certain comments, I'm going to. Um, this is provided by the, the uh, school committee, school department, to the finance committee. Uh, we had several good page, lots of pages, a lot of statistics on where we are and how we're low and medium and so forth. So I just dipped my hand into the, in the pool and came up with one or two here. How much did total pupil cost increase? The state average was 8.07. We like to compare ourselves to, to Cape Elizabeth. What was their increase over four years? 12 and a half, 12.2, 12 percent, let's say. Scarborough, 25.86 percent. How much did school instruction and support cost increase? State, 9%, Cape Elizabeth, 16 Scarborough, 21 So we may be lower in salaries, but we're coming on strong. We're coming on strong here. Um, we've had what's been, been um, said is extraordinary circumstances this year and in the, in the last few years. Uh, certainly a million dollars cut by the state is, is significant. When it happens the first year, it's extraordinary. When it lasts for three or four years, and we've been told by members of the Finance Committee that that's what we can expect next year, it's no longer um, extraordinary. It's the new norm, and we have to adjust to that. The budget has increased over, uh, by $6.9 million the last five years. I'm suggesting that you add a million and a half dollars to last year's budget. Um, 
Thank you. My name is Jody Shea. I live at 23 Windsor Pines Drive. I'm also a member of the school board. I wasn't planning on speaking, so forgive me. I have my notes on my phone. And it goes against everything to not fact check all of that. I'm a big fact person, but I'm speaking about something different. I, I hate to be the bearer of discouraging news, but this is a losing battle for everybody. Um, you're in a tough position, and I can only hope that we look at this as an opportunity. Tonight, there are two groups of people here, those that supported the budget and don't want any further reductions, and those that do not support the budget and want cuts made to keep their taxes low. I think we all need to take a step back and find a solution, not a Band-Aid. Cutting the school budget actually doesn't make anyone happy. The supporters will be angry, the non-supporters will be angry that it's not enough, and the divide will grow larger. What that says to me is that this town is in need of a solution. I've talked to a few of you one-on-one. -on -one. I've also mentioned it at a joint meeting. We are the leaders in this town, and it's now time to lead. We can't put a Band-Aid on a broken leg. It just doesn't work. You need to treat the wound. Our wound here in Scarborough is that there are people in this town who have lived here a long time and raised their own families here, want to stay here until the next chapter. Well, we need to help them be able to do that, but that's not cutting the school budget. We've tried that and it doesn't work. It's a short-term solution to a long-term issue. Create a program. Create a program. Allow the citizens to volunteer. Earn a tax credit. They do that in SACO. Freeze property taxes of qualifying citizens until they sell their house or pass away or move on. Um, raise the daily rate at the beach parking lot. I don't care. Just create a solution. Put that money aside for a tax relief. It doesn't need to be giant leaps. It needs to be a solution. And for me, that's not reducing the budget. We've done that over and over, sending it back to the voters to, for too many years. It's not working. I hope that some of you find the strength to stop the divide and create a solution. Thank you. Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. I happen to agree with several of uh, Jody Shea's points there. I think we do need a plan. Uh, one of the things that I've proposed in the past is that the council tell the town manager and tell the school superintendent we will not pass any budget on to the citizens if it exceeds a certain percentage. <coughs> My proposal is 3%. The school superintendent and the town manager, highly skilled, highly intelligent people, if they know at the end of this year what they're going to have to spend next year, they can start making some plans. <coughs> I also agree uh, with Ms. Shea on several of her, of her suggestions there. The plan needs to come about. This, this, I agree, this is absolutely horrible every year. Everybody walks out of June or July a mental wreck. If you make the plan, stick to it. 3% in my estimation is a good estimate. 3% uh, of $36 million is what the school would have had to, the school would have known they had to spend next year and he could have spent his time, Mr. Entwistle could have spent his time organizing that figure to meet his budget. Thank you. And anybody else? All right, seeing none, we will close the comment. And so we are on the first reading and schedule a public hearing and the second reading on the proposed 2016 school budget. Fine. Do you have a motion? Does, um, so, point of order: Does the uh, um, order itself, as a whole, need to be read as a motion first before? Yes. Would you Ooh. like me to do that? Is that what you're asking for? Passage. Yes. Okay. So I'd move um, approval of order number 15-048, budget order for fiscal year 2016 school budget. Whereas the Scarborough Town Council adopted fiscal year 2016's operational and capital budgets for the town and the school on May 20, 2015 with the passage of order number 15-026.
<clears throat> and whereas pursuant to state law, the school budget must be validated by the voters and it failed at a special election held on June 9th, 2015. And whereas the town council must resubmit an adjusted school budget to the voters for validation no less than 10 days and no more than 45 days from June 9th, 2015. Now therefore be it ordered that the Scarborough Town Council moves approval of the first reading to adopt a, uh, the fiscal year 2016 educational budget and schedule a public hearing for 7 p.m. on Wednesday, June 24th, 2015, as well as the second reading, and be it further ordered that the Scarborough Town Council hereby appropriates for school purposes the education operating budget, the sum of $43,793,756, and the Town of Scarborough raises as the local share for the education operating budget, the sum of $38,794 and I'm sorry, $794,000 and and I said that wrong. I got to sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My eyesight's adjusting with the glasses on. It's $38,794,379. And, and that's that in the form of a motion. motion. Do we have a second? Second. Sarah, okay. so, thank you for reading that. I didn't have it right. in front of me. <clears throat> works, works, works well. Thank you. So, um, so now we're on our first reading. And um, tonight, if, if, I just want to point out that we do have. Um, few motions. You should have a copy in front of you um, that got passed out to each of you. So like I said, there are a series of motions that we should be looking at. And Sean, you have the first one. Absolutely. Thank you. And I believe uh, for structural purposes, this would be the fourth whereas. Um, I didn't necessarily write it in that format, but um, I'm sure the town clerk and the manager mm -hmm. will make sure that it's inserted appropriately. Um, um, it says, my motion is to uh, move to amend the order to reflect. It should it be known before the time of the tax commitment that the state of Maine provides additional funds for K through 12 education as described in the Essential Programs and Services Funding Act in an amount greater than approved in this order, those funds will be used to reduce the amount of the property taxes needed to support this budget. And that was in the form of a motion, so was there a second? Second. And go ahead. And so um, the challenge that we have, one, because of the way that our fiscal year doesn't coincide necessarily with the state's um, in the sense that um, it's at the same exact time, so we're really guessing on what we're going to get. And um, the um, irony of this is that last evening, if you weren't aware, um, the state actually passed its budget um, unanimously in the Senate um, and then with a two-thirds majority in the House that will be redirecting over a two-year period about $80 million to education or $40 million per year. Um, we know what our current um, estimated, uh, estimated amount is in GPA co um, coming from the state based upon um, the pre-adjusted amount that um, was approved last evening. The purpose of this is really what I hope is to build a bridge um, through the community's um, knowledge process that they can be assured that when that money does come in um, that it will be applied if it is known in advance of when the assessed valuation is set as well as when the budget is approved. Um, that it will go directly to the tax base because that is what it is for. Um, I do want to say one piece um, with that, and that is um, this is in no way a reflection of the relationship that we already have because over time the school board has always uh, provided excess revenues um, as a means of transference uh, through the surplus process. The issue with this is that if we are lucky enough to know what that amount is um, in advance, then it will go into this year's budget and not wait to be a transfer next year. Um, that way, the impact of any additional adjustments that are made later um, in this dialogue um, will be combined with that. And while the DOE and, and even uh, Maine uh, Educational Association uh, warns us not to necessarily estimate, at least in uh, my contacts with the State House, um, we're hoping um, that that adjustment based on the $40 million this year could be anywhere from an additional six hundred dollars to $700,000 in additional GPA for our community, um, which is an incredible um, achievement, um, which uh, at least caused me to uh, really want to speak out and thank uh, Senator Volk uh, for speaking up in the Senate and being part of the unanimous vote that came out um, in supporting that, mm -hmm. and then also to Representative Vashon, who voted in favor of that as part of the majority in the House, because it is something that does um, provide direct re relief to our taxpayers. So I hope that um, uh, you will all join me in, in making the statement to the community that so they are assured that we're taking care of what is necessary for them. Does any other discussion on the amendment? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, um, I do just want to say um, thank you to Sean for, for bringing this forward. Um, I did hear that there was a similar um, endeavor for Ingorum to do something very similar to this. Um, I certainly could be more than happy to support um, plugging in any, any numbers that we get that are additional dollars um, and trying to plug that into this year to help offset the cost of, of delivering our education. Um, although I will say as much as I heard good news, I also heard bad news just before I walked in, which is oh, yes. I, I heard something about line item veto. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but hopefully it's things move forward, but we'll work out and, and be all right and get a little <laughs> little more than we were anticipating out of our, or should we say, not get as severe as a reduction as we were anticipating. So, Peter? Yeah, just kind of a, for, for myself and the audience and others, so, so trying to boil it down, I have to keep it simple principle. Sure. So, so what this is saying is that we are authorizing them to spend the 43793 number that you talked about if these monies come in by the time we establish the assessed value in the mill rate, which is sometime in August, yes, is that is that sort of the time frame, early August, mid-August? Yes. Then we're saying that, that whatever those monies are that are in excess of the numbers that are reflected here will get returned to the taxpayers in a reduced mill rate. Correct. If it comes in after that period of time, and because we do the taxation in two billing cycles, but there's not an opportunity then to build in. If it comes in after the August date, but before you need to send out the second billing, there isn't a mechanism to get that into the second second real estate. So, that, so people at town will get the money back in next calendar year rather than having to wait? There may be. I frankly have never been involved. I think it may involve setting a second tax rate, recalculating the tax rate based on additional revenue, uh, or I suppose you could do some sort of direct rebate program to the residents, uh, frankly, either of those options seem overly difficult. <laughs> um, the good news is, and I want everyone assured, that uh, the school board can't spend any more than they are authorized by the voters to spend. So this additional revenue uh, doesn't get spent, it doesn't evaporate, it would be realized and received in the fiscal year as unbudgeted, unexpected revenue, if you will, and ultimately become year-end surplus. And so it would be available uh, for consideration and use in future years, which uh, may, may be necessary. Um. Well, thank you, Tom. Anybody else? Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor of Sean's motion, and that is unanimous. All right. Motion number two, Councillor Blaze. Uh, move approval to reduce the education operating budget approved by the Town Council on May 20th, 2015 and which failed to be validated by the voters on June 9, 2015 by an additional $2 million. And that was in the form of a motion, so is there a second? For the uh, purpose of discussion, uh, I'll uh, second it. Well, hey, we've got that. And dis uh, discussion, or actually, Ed, if you wouldn't lead us into that. The purpose is very simple. I, I don't want to see a tax increase of more than 2%. And $2 million gets us back down to 2%. This town is, I mean, our tax rate has been anywhere from, well, last year it was close to 2%. Last year we did a pretty good job, but um, anywhere from 2.2% to 7% in the last five or six years. I mean, it's way too high. We can't ask our people to continue to shell out all this money. So that's where I'm coming from. I don't want to see any more increases over the over the two percent. Thank you. Uh Jim Ray. Um uh, Councillor Blaze knows that I appreciate his <laughs> his continued efforts to keep us within the COLA. And I, if there's nothing else, Councilor Blaze, you're consistent. And I like that. That's good. And you bring these forward. Um, I obviously would disagree with, with this amount, um, particularly I know I sound like I'm saying the same thing over and over and over again, but I am, uh, given um, the loss of revenues uh, by the school department uh, with state aid and, and other factors, I, I feel that um, uh, a cut of $2 million would do significant damage to our schools, and um, I just couldn't support it. Anybody else? 
Sean. So um, I, I just want to concur with uh, uh, Councilman Katarina, because um, I too appreciate um, not only consistency, but the fact that uh, Council of Blaze is extremely principled and sticks to those principles. And I think that there's, that speaks value, not only um, really from both ends of the, um, of the spectrum, and I've served with both, the most uh, ardent conservatives and the most liberal of, um, of educators. So um, I do respect that completely. I, I do agree. I think the, the one thing is that putting the onus of that type of an adjustment, which I don't necessarily disagree with, depending on how you interpret the outcome of uh, the referendum vote, completely on the school budget um, is, I think, unfair and um, in some ways morally reprehensible because the impact of the state's reduction in education isn't necessarily related just to the reduction in students at schools. It's also related to the increased value of the community as a whole. And I think that if we're going to explore that size of a reduction, it really should be incumbent upon us to actually reopen the entire budget process for both the town um, as well as the schools, because I think that there are certain principles that have been, you know, been exposed or maybe um, commented on, such as the use of projected surpluses for the current year, uh, reductions of COLA. I don't think it's fair to suggest that um, maybe one of the adjustments is to reduce the COLA on the educational side, but to say <coughs> that it's okay for COLA on the um, municipal side should be approved. I, I think they both should be approved, but I don't think that that is a fair policy for us to embark on, and I think that if we were going to support this, that it really needs to be something that um, looks at best practices across the board for all departments so that we're no longer, because for many, many years, and I've been around for a few, um, we've constantly had this internal um, conflict that is somewhat quiet where our municipal employees uh, can sometimes feel under um, appreciated. Um, when the school employees may receive more benefit in one particular year, as well as vice versa. And I think that we really have a responsibility to approach these type of drastic changes more evenly and, and um, handedly across the board. Um, so I'm not, I'm not in support of this as it is currently structured, um, but I think that if it's going to, in future years, if this is the approach, I think that we really need to look at some of these policies that um, really that can be applied across the board for both budgets. <coughs> Excuse me. Anybody else? And, and I guess I'd kind of echo my fellow counselors and appreciate your, your thought and, and process. And for me, at least what happened yesterday, I think there is some optimism that there may be some additional revenues coming. So given that, we'll also come back into the tax base. I think this is a little, you know, little steep, so I'd support something less than this, but I, but I really respect your thought. Anybody else? Well, I'm just going to say ditto. We, I, I love you, Ed Blaze. You really are. You, you're, you're good to your word, um, and I do appreciate you. So with that, all those in favor of the, of the motion? And that is one. And all those opposed, that is so, oh, on to the next one, motion number three. Councillor Blaze is back, back, back again. <laughs> you guys started talking about this one. I know. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Move approval to reduce right. the education operating budget approved by the town council on May 20th, 2015, and which failed to be validated by the voters on June 9th, 2015, by an additional $616,000. For purposes of discussion, okay. I'll second the motion. Okay, and go ahead and lead us into the discussion on, on this one. Okay, $616,000 is the amount of the COLA increases for the school. Uh, and it's my feeling that uh, uh, here's $616,000 uh, $616, that can come right out of the budget, which probably amounts to about it would bring the tax rate down to four and a half percent, roughly, from what it is now. Uh, but it would have absolutely no impact on any educational programs or educational opportunities for the kids. All right, discussion. Team Marie. Again, with all due respect to my fellow counselor, um, it, most of the uh, 
salaries in the school department are, are um, negotiated salaries in their uh, contracts. So you can't go breaking contracts without major repercussions. So um, I just don't, st it's a nice thought, but I can't support it. John? I, d I was able to do some research because I think that this is, um, Kind of a very important because it seems like that we constantly, to some comments that were made by citizens and school board members, we're constantly attacking the wages that we pay our employees at whatever level. So um, I belong to a couple of organizations for work. Um, the first is the Society of Human Resource Managers, both the uh, uh, Southern Maine as well as the national organization. And looking at their um, latest survey, which is uh, conducted by World at Bank, the salary, bud the salary budget survey. Um, the request for not only the schools um, increase in COLA, um, but also even the towns is actually below projections by just about every major um, um, analytical group. I've looked at what was called the Mercer Report. I looked at the SHRM, and what they had suggested was that for non-exempt hourly union employees, that it, even in 2014, the average should have been 3%. But if you look at what Scarborough paid at both levels and both budgets, we were below that. And then in 2015, they're also expecting and forecasting anywhere from 3.0% to 3.1%, which on the average, the 2% that is being projected across the board for both budgets is well below that. You know, and, and then just thinking about the economic recovery, because there's always these comments about fledgling recovery and, and about what is the economic impact. The fact is that for, in order for economic growth to speed up, real income needs to increase. And if we're constantly keeping real income down, even at the little amount that we're doing it at, um, how on earth are we going to have that economic recovery that everyone wants? Um, I'm not suggesting that we need to um, blow that up and give 5% or even more, but I think that um, they should be at least at both levels be paid um, a fair market rate that is competitive um, and that keeps them um, employed because we have a highly qualified and um, a very skilled workforce on both sides of the table. Um, um, I don't agree with you. Um, the cost of living increase is a cost of living increase. If the cost of living doesn't go up, why should you get an increase? And I understand that it's, these are contracts. But it's my understanding also that in a number of years past, the police department forego, <coughs> uh, forewent their uh, increases to help the budget. Now, why can't the school do the same thing? That's my only point. And if if contracts across the country are going up 3%, then you should change the name of, you shouldn't call it a COLA. It's not a COLA. It's something else. That's, that's where I stand. That's okay. <laughs> Just a, a factual point. Um, um, for many years, having been an executive um, and working in primarily banking, but even in nonprofit, um, very rarely do you hear the word COLA nowadays. Most organizations, including the last bank that I work for, a major international bank, it's called a merit increase. So I think it depends on the organization and the culture of that organization on what it is called. Regardless of whether it's labeled as a merit increase or whether it's a COLA, it's still an increase. So. I understand and I respect that we can disagree, so um, I just wanted to mention it, it can change depending upon the industry that you're in. Any, any, anybody else? All right, well, I will chime in. So, I, um, I did see this come in today and I, and I was looking at it and um, I, I, I think I'm almost there, but I'm not quite there. Uh, and when I say that, I'm looking at the dollar figure because I'm appreciating that as much as we have this great dialogue about COLA and not COLA and, and, and the reality of it is is we have no line item authority to say that. Right. So, um, you know, where where the school board chooses to spend it, the, its money that it's allocated is, is really uh, up to them. Um, certainly they could choose to maybe break contract, but um, I don't think that's likely. Um, I think it's more likely that it'll come out of probably programming mm -hmm. or something to that effect. Um, so again, I, I'm back at looking at the whole number. Um, 
as much as I'm, I'm almost there, I, I'm not quite at that number. I think there's another number that's coming that, that I could really support. Um, I think that's just a little too much of a chunk to, to bite out of one year knowing, um, you know, we will probably do better, yes, than we were anticipating at the state, but the crystal ball says, you know, I don't know that I, <laughs> I agree with 600,000, which gets thrown around, but um, yeah. I, I'd like to play it just a little more more cautious. Um, so, um, but I do appreciate that you've offered offered this. So, with that, does anybody else wish to add anything to the? No? All right. So, all those in favor? And there's two. And all those opposed. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that three? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and all those opposed is four. So, our next motion is motion number four, Councillor St. Clair. I'm not going to give it. No. Okay. So, um, Madam we, Chair. Yeah. Uh, if I may, I'd like to make motion four. Okay. Councillor Donovan's going to offer motion four. Would you please go ahead in the form of a motion, state what your amendment would be. Uh, move approval to reduce the education operating budget approved by the town council on May 20, 2015, and which failed to be validated by the voters on June 9, 2015, by an additional $350,000. Second. All right, and um, I want to go ahead and uh, go ahead and lead us into that conversation. Thank you. Uh, it's it's hard to come up with what's the right number. Uh, uh, how do you decide how to adjust the budget, the school budget number, in light of uh, the referendum uh, having said it was uh, rejected? I looked at a whole series, and I've been thinking about probably nothing else for the last, well, since the uh, referendum turned the budget uh, down. Uh, and, and let me just talk about some of the things that I think influenced my thinking. Uh, one, I don't think the school's uh, spun, uh, spending is at all excessive. We have per pupil cost data that tells us <coughs> our school is spending right in the middle of the state. Uh, and we have a lot of low-income communities in the state so that when you're right in the middle, you're nothing special. You're not spending anything extraordinarily. I think our schools have demonstrated that they are a particularly good value. Uh, not only are they uh, helping to increase our property values, which has caused us to lose millions uh, under the formula, but if you look at any of the metrics by which you would judge this, you can see how well our schools are regarded. Uh, per capita income is really the benchmark that, that separates uh, schools. If you look at towns that have a high per capita income, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Cape Elizabeth, they are all at the top uh, uh, of the uh, schools testing performances. Uh, if you adjust for per capita income, the number one school in the state is Scarborough. Uh, it is not just on that either. If you look at school enrollment and you look at the top ten schools in the state of Maine, uh, Scarborough is the only school that, uh, that has more than 3,000 students uh, and uh, there is no other school that has anywhere near the academic performance where they have more than 3,000 students uh, in the school system. I looked at the school budget from the point of view of are they uh, uh, pushing the envelope in terms of programs or hiring or special, uh, uh, special interests. This is a level services budget. This is an essential services budget. The only places it went up were places like special, uh, special ed. These were mandated by law. Uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, the school board did exactly what the town council asked all of our community to do, 
to set a level services budget because we are experiencing difficult times uh, with uh, uh, revenue, and we knew we were going to experience difficult times with revenue on the school side. The increase is not due to uh, excessive school spending. It's due to uh, primarily the most significant factor is an increase in our assessed values. So that while, yes, I do think that 5.8 is an excessive increase. It is too much, but it was largely driven by circumstances such as the loss of revenue, which has been going on for years, uh, 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 to the school system. And so we, the town of Scarborough, have been asked to make that up, uh, rather than allow our property values to be diminished. And it was the right decision. It was the right decision in years past. It's the right decision now. Uh, my comfort level as far as a number, and really it's pick, pick a number. Uh, 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 to me, uh, when the voters get to come out and the voters say the budget is too high, you do not say, well, I'm going to dismiss that. You be respectful uh, to the voters and the vote that was cast. Uh, and it defeated the budget that was presented and proposed by us. Uh, we, don't, we didn't have the final say. The referendum has the final say. My comfort level is about $250,000. That represents a significant uh, uh, cut, but nevertheless, it's one that is not going to devastate the schools. The school can adjust to it. Uh, uh, but I also realize that I'm just one of seven voices. Uh, and. I need to be willing to compromise. And so that's why I've presented a motion for $350,000, because I've heard people say, well, you shouldn't re reduce it at all. Other people have said you should, you should reduce it by $500,000. Well, my 250 may be too low. 500 may be too high. Well, I think 350000 is about right. I'd like to close by saying uh, I think the solution uh, lies not just in voting on and, and have confrontational relationships on the budget, but there are other things that we as a town council and as elected representatives in Augusta should be doing. We should have more tools for addressing the needs of low-income people. One of the things that I have committed personally, and I haven't really shared it with any of the town council members because I've just been waiting to see how the state budget comes out, is the senior low-income tax credit. Uh, and the state really botched it last year, uh, and, and it sent our program into a state of disarray. Uh, and so uh, I've been speaking with the main municipal association lobbyist uh, who is familiar with this so as to at least do some homework on what we as a town council might be able to do to help low-income seniors uh, in our town uh, so that those who are truly on fixed incomes, low incomes, could uh, be able to get some relief from these tax uh, increases. Uh, I absolutely abhor tax increases at this level, but it is uh, the, the hand we've been dealt uh, I'm prepared to compromise, and that's why I think 350000 uh, is a good number, and I plan on trying to make an effort at trying to have our seniors, low-income seniors, uh, before this year is out, uh, have a program that is, again, returned to respectability. Jim Ray? Jim Ray? Yeah, thank you. Um, well stated, Council Dunn, and, um, and I appreciate all your facts, but like, um, some other people around here, I have a pretty bad cold and I get talking and I cough hysterically. So I'm just going to make a couple of points because there has been tossed around an idea of a $500,000 reduction also. And I know I've given great thought for the last two days. You can ask uh, Manager Hall. I've called him and bugged him eight million times about what if, what if, what if um, with different numbers and permutations and, and whatnot. 
Um, and this is how um, I'm looking at it. At a $350,000 reduction in the school budget, it would be a mill rate of approximately $15.86 per thousand, um, <clears throat> which on a $300,000 house, which is the, I can't remember if it's the average or medium, uh, in Scarborough is $4,758. Um, at a $500,000 reduction, the mill rate is $1582. Now, so $350,000 is $1586. $500,000 is $1582. That's four cents. When I'm negotiating in real estate deals, I, I come up against this a lot. That $150,000 difference buys a lot of education. But it's not making a huge impact on the tax rate. So I, I would I would encourage my fellow counselors to keep that in mind when you're looking at uh, the numbers here. Are we going to go for a mill rate of 1586 that allows the schools to maintain 150,000, or are we going to cut it 500,000 to save four cents per thousand? That's all I have to say. Okay. Hey. Um, I think this is a, uh, I, first I want to apologize to Councillor Donovan, I think I caught, I definitely caught him off guard. I, I think this is a prime example of coming into a meeting and you walk into it thinking one way and believing strongly in one way and um, hearing from people and processing things and um, there's a lot going on and you change your mind or you think a different way or you're hoping to push something else. Um, I was at the $350,000 level. Um, I was comfortable with that. I felt like that was a good somewhere in between. Um, and then I started looking at um, the tax rate implications. I also I looked at that, and I also want to, on the flip side, I want to say I'm curious, uh, the people that voted and the people that are sending us emails that are upset, I wonder how much time they've spent in the schools. Um, my kids go to school. I am in their schools quite often. I get them on and off the bus. Um, these people are working hard, and um, th that's why I, this is really the, the worst time of year. I actually despise this time of year because I, I wear the hat of being a parent and a mother and seeing, literally seeing how hard these teachers work. Um, they put their own money into these kids. They... Um, they put more time, a lot of people say, oh, teachers have it so great, they get the summer off. These teachers don't get the summer off. They're in, they're in the schools all year round, and I, I see that. Um, the flip side of that and the hard side of that is that I'm, I'm a town counselor, and I believe that the school board, I, I will never um, say a bad thing about them because they're doing their job. Their job is to advocate and get every last penny they can for those schools. The hard part is that our job is we have to provide for all of Scarborough, and that does make it extremely difficult. Um, so I, originally I did. I came in with the 350000 um, I thought more about it. I looked at some things. I looked at some more numbers, um, and so that's why I sort of flip-flopped a little bit, um, and so I do apologize for that. Um, but I do want to say that I guess, I guess my final point is, please, if you, if you have time, go into the schools. Spend a little bit of time in those schools. Um, I know multiple principals and multiple teachers that will, you send them an email and they will gladly accept you into their classroom so that you can see firsthand what they are doing for these kids. And it is amazing things. Um, but I can't support the 350. Um, I just don't, I don't think, it's enough for what we need in this town right now. I think we have, this year, we have too many people struggling. Um, I hate this process. I don't think it's right. I think there has to, there has got to be a better way to do this. I don't know what that is, and I think we need to, we need to put our heads together and figure out what it is, because this process and what this school board goes through and what we go through and what our town goes through is not right, and it's not working. Um, and that is not any saying anything negative at all about either one of the finance boards at all. It's just saying that something's not right here. 
Um, we can't have this sort of disarray in our town every time we come up for a budget. It doesn't work. So, I, that, I, yeah, that, that's it for me. Anybody else wish to? I, I, well, you're not See, you guys doing one of these. Gentlemen first. Go ahead. I love Paul. Sure. Um, so there's a lot been said. Um, I look at this uh, motion first. I do want to uh, extend an appreciation to Councilor St. Clair for putting it forward, um, as well as to uh, Councilor Donovan for making the motion, because I think that um, we have to set a baseline in which we begin the discussion. And this is the baseline. And I think that to uh, complement some of the comments that have been made is that we do need to be respectful of what the outcome of the, ele of the referendum was, because I think that it um, did speak volumes. Um, to not only um, the commitment of our community, because if you look at the numbers, by the way, we had 3,100, a little over 3,100 people vote, uh, regardless of how they voted. And if you actually add up, um, including the city of Portland, which is like three and a half times larger, the city of Portland, Cape Elizabeth, Gorham, and I believe Buxton, all combined didn't even come close to 3,100 people voting. So I do think that we have an informed citizenry that understands the challenge um, of, of what we're facing as a council, as well as even as a school board, but also um, expressing what they're facing as a challenge. So um, I do appreciate and recognize the, um, um, that comment that was made as part of the referendum. Um, you know, um, it's been said, and it, you know, this job, no matter whether it's a school board or the town council, um, there's a lot of analogies. It's like uh, throwing uh, darts in, in, at a dartboard with a blindfold on. Um, it's like using an eight ball, trying to find an answer that doesn't even give you a definitive answer on any of the questions that you might ask the eight ball, because um, you don't know really what is everyone's comfort level, and it's, it's extremely challenging on that. Um, so, but one of the things I do want to stress, though, is that um, you know, there's a lot of criticism about um, leadership, and I would strongly disagree with the criticism that says that either of the two boards have shown a lack of leadership, because leadership is about the exercise of finding compromise and the adversity that we're faced with. And I think that starting at this $350,000 is that part of that compromise because, you know, like you, I've, I've heard um, comments and questions about um, whether or not a $500,000 initiative should be undertaken. I think that whether it's three fifty dollars or five hundred, dollars um, not being able to have control over how the school board adjusts, that's their job and their expertise. Um, I think it's going to impact on um, the students and their families um, in any way possible, in every way possible, uh, from the smallest program um, to maybe even larger programs. We don't know what their, um, what their mission is as far as where they're going to focus on that. And um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention was that, um, sorry, I had notes everywhere about all this. No, it's okay. You know, I, I wanted to mention is that because one of the other criticisms in this process and trying to identify is that um, it's not only the school board's responsibility to advocate for what our students need, it's also us as a town council to advocate what this community needs. And so I will take every day the criticism of being either too loud or too vocal when criticizing state legislators um, who I think need to advocate stronger for what this community needs, including more funding for education, protecting main revenue sharing, and every other aspect that impacts our budget. And I have no problem with that, and I'll defend that to the day that I am office council. So, um, you know, that is where we need to focus, and I think that, you know, the, the two representatives um, that voted in favor of the additional educational spending, as well as protecting main revenue shares, um, had a lot of courage in doing that for us, and I think that they listened, um, and I appreciate the input that's been given from everyone regarding that, and I do respect it. Um, again, I think the 350 is a positive start. I'm not adverse to increasing that, but I need to understand more about um, where is it that the, com the community wants? Um, you know, I, I know for a fact I'm going to get comments from citizens who are going to say we should have voted in favor of $2 million. And we're going to have uh, members who are going to say that it, we should send the same budget back out. Um, but I, again, it gets down to that respectful part of, of at least um, respecting what the outcome of this past referendum is, and I think that this is the proper start for that conversation. Thank you, Sean. Peter. And I guess I kind of echo um, sort of Councilor St. Clair. I also have a child in middle school, and, and I'll agree it's been an exceptional experience. He's just really enjoyed. He's really thrived. He's had great teachers all the way through. Sort of my thought process, and someone told me the hardest job being up here is we all have our own personal opinions on what we'd like to do, but I think what some of us sometimes forget, we're 
we were elected to be here to represent all of you out there in the audience. What we have to be thinking about doing is what is our community, what does the majority of our community want? I think it was pretty clear with, with the referendum that went out that the majority of our community told us this budget is too high. They expect some type of adjustment. I think <coughs> our accountability and our responsibility to listen, that's what we're supposed to do. We're your elected officials. So having said that, I think the 350 is a starting point. If you remember right back when we started, we did offer a 250 number that wasn't supported at the time. My issue, I think this is a, a little bit low. I thought the Councillor Blaze was a little bit high. The problem is a 350 adjustment is less than a half of a percent. I really think people, when they went to the polls, were looking for more than a half a percent adjustment. And the beauty <coughs> of the way we do this, just as we went out with a budget that voters told us it was too high, they certainly have an option this time if we don't get it dialed in right to tell us that it's too low. That's kind of the, the beauty of this project. <coughs> but I'm kind of leaning that I think, I think our constituency, the majority of them, feel differently. And I, I really take offense when we start trying to divide our community and saying we don't like children or some people don't support children. <coughs> For all the community, it's the community resources. You should get to decide where you want to spend your resources. So I think we need to listen to you. So I, I guess where I am, I'm not going to support the 350. I think it's somewhere in between the ranges of numbers we've talked about this evening. <laughs> Can you make it through? <laughs> <laughs> we just got to say one last yeah, thing before sure. I expire of coughing here. Um, again, I'd remind people that at $500,000 reduction, your taxes on a $300,000 house are $4,746. At a $350,000 reduction, your taxes on the same house are $4,758. That's a $12 difference. That's all. All right. Anybody else? All right. So on the 350. So um, I'm going to go back to a couple weeks ago when I said, um, you know, Peter had offered his motion at 250, and I had said, I'm not quite there yet. Um, you know, let me let me come back to that at another meeting if we need to. Um, I. I I appreciate that we've had conversations kind of, you know, up and we've had down, we've had left, we've had right, um, you know, we've had something as big as $2 million. Now, now we're, we're down in the 350 Um I don't plan to support the 350 I think it's a little low. Um, I, I did say as you mean and, you know, all those lo lovely, you know, adages. Um, I think the budget that went out was level service. I think the vote that came back was something less than level service. And what I'm hoping for when we're done with, with our, you know, motions this evening is that we have a dollar number that we can go to our community and say, meet me in the middle. Um, you know, of course, you know, it didn't pass at level service, and we understand that. Those of you that felt that the education budget was perfect, um, you know, try to meet us in the middle and understand that there were those that could not afford it for whatever reason or whatever personal choice. And I'm going to ask the same things of those that voted no. You know, meet me in the middle a little bit here because no, we can't gut our education department. Um, we appreciate that perhaps level services <coughs> is not where you're at. We will have to make some adjustments. Um, but I think the 350 doesn't quite get us there to, you know, there's that sweet spot number. You know, where, where do we want to try to be and ask people to be supportive, be supportive of. So um, with that, all those in favor of the 350, and that is one, two, three. All those opposed is one, two, three, four. So the next motion is motion number five, Councillor Hayes. Move approval to reduce the education operating budget approved by the Town Council on May 20th, 2015, which failed to be validated by the voters on June 9th, 2015, by an additional 500,000 for a new net education budget of 38, 256, 945. And that is in the form of a motion. Is there a second? Second. And discussion. <coughs> Peter. Uh, sorry. It yes. It's, it's a gift later. I forget. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> lead, us, lead us into the discussion, please. And, and I guess where I am, and I, I talked a little bit just before, I, I, I really believe after sitting through the process and, and, and participating that this is a number that should not impact the delivery of services to our children, to the programming. 
I say that a little bit because of some of the things we've talked about already, but more importantly, I'm part of an organization, was part of an organization um, in different supermarkets, um, very low margin business. Every year we'd go through this process and we would have these budget goals and always the goal was try to do what you do, same level of services, but try to do it for two to five percent less. What it actually forced us to do is actually you would look at processes that you did, you would find efficiencies, and what it ended up doing instead of reducing services, we found ways to spend less money but actually improve our performance, improve the services. That's what businesses do. You always ruthlessly look for things that you can do better and more efficiently. So I really believe the 500,000 is sort of a sweet zone where it, we certainly heard from our voters. I think the 500,000, there should be ways to look at the programming and not impact essential services to our children. But I do want to come back to, and I think there were some great, and I think Kate talked about it, some comments from the audience. What really struck me is we need a plan. I mean, I absolutely agree, and we talked a little bit about it in our workshop earlier. We go through this process every year. It got better from, I wasn't around in previous years. It, it got better this year, but we need to do a better job. We need to start earlier. Some folks offered some suggestion about advisory committees and other things, so I think I'd echo that. We need to do a better process. Two, these types of shortfalls in funding from federal and state entities is not extraordinary. It is the new normal. And I think we as every community, as every household, as every business, you've got to learn to live within the resources that are going to be available. We have to start thinking and planning about this is the new normal. <coughs> How can we as a community come together and do what we need to do? So I think this is sort of a great starting point. That's, that's some of my rationale. And, I, and as I said earlier, the, the 350 is less than a half a percent. The 500 is about a 1% reduction, in, in which I think is, is something that we were probably getting message from you know, our constituency that that's what they want. If we've missed the target, we can always go back to the apple. But I really hope this is sort of the sweet spot. All right. And thank you for your introduction. John. Um, <clears throat> I, um, so this is the other baseline that I kind of looked at and to try to determine am I comfortable with it. And to some extent, uh, using the same uh, comment that Councillor Caterina <coughs> used, the differentiation between the 350 and this is $12. So to me, this isn't a very large gap um, between uh, two philosophical approaches. It's more difficult, obviously, to find the extra 150,000 over the 350, but I do at least, and I, and I um, to some extent, um, want to explain. I, I've never really looked at the school's budget by itself <coughs> and tried to argue or approve um, their spending based upon solely on their increase by itself, because the fact is, is that we need to recognize that they do not have um, an unlimited or um, any significant amount of revenue sources other than GPA and other uh, revenues you get from the state through special education. So, you know, I do look at the revenues that can be generated in the town, and I do agree with Councillor uh, um, <coughs> Hayes. It is about a 1%. The $500,000 is about a 1%, and I'm looking at the total um, tax reduction, which is a, always more palatable. Um, I do want to mention the one thing. I agree with, um, I think it was school board member Jody Shea who mentioned, we need to find a solution, something deeper, more meaningful than this process. And, you know, and I'm glad that Councillor Hayes brought this up because in our workshop before we talked about the goals that we set, uh, one, how we set them, but then also how do we measure our success and do we look outside of just the council's input um, and looking to the community. And one of those concepts that I've been um, advocating for and I believe that we have a commitment to do, it's really a new concept called aging in place. And how can a community like Scarborough look at other communities and say, you know, um, are we offering tax credits for this, that, and the other different types of programs so that when you live in Scarborough for 50 years, you're not being forced out of town? Um, as well as if you've lived in Scarborough for five years to remain that you can, you can actually remain in town. So um, I really think that is a very important step for us to take as a whole. It doesn't solve our problem today and it doesn't provide a solution. But... Um, to the $500,000, I can support it primarily because unless someone brings another motion forward, if this fails, this suggests that we're willing to send to the voters the same budget that they have already rejected, and that to me is not a solution at all. So I'm going to support the $500,000 that the councilors uh, recommended. Jim Ray? I can't talk much, obviously. I thought you would be correct. The 500000 was the other point I was looking at. Um, and I, you know, 
reluctantly. I will support it, but I will support it as much just to support the town council. I'd like to see this, whatever we vote on, come out unanimously. So that would be the reason I would support this. Thank you. Uh, I, I do think that debate and dialogue and compromise is an essential part of uh, how you arrive at good decisions. Uh, I also think there isn't a significant difference between 350 and $500,000 to the point where uh, I couldn't find a way to compromise my views and support that. Uh, I think it's uh, short-sighted uh, because I think the uh, schools deserve better of us, uh, quite honestly. Uh, they're doing an exceptional job uh, and, uh, and they're worthy of uh, our support. But under the circumstances, I think unanimity of voice uh, going out to the community for this next referendum vo uh, vote, I think is important, and therefore I will support this. <coughs> Anybody else wish to turn up? Wow, okay. All right, well, me again. Um, so again, I just want to reiterate, um, I, I, I do hope that the, the members at large in the community um, can, can find it within themselves to kind of come and meet us in the middle a little bit here. Um, you know, I know the, the folks that are concerned that it was too much to ask for this year, you know, it doesn't go as deep as, as some have asked of us and, you know, in their communications with us. And the same token, it, it doesn't, you know, maybe goes a little too far with some other folks. Um, what, I, again, I'm, I'm hoping to um, suggest is that we all meet in the middle a little bit here. Um, we have to pass something. We have to move forward as a community, and it can't be moving us backward either. Um, I will say um, one of the things I like about the 500,000, I, I think it was a happy medium. I mean, just like you guys, I've, I've heard numbers all over the place. Um, I do have a handy dandy tax rate computation sheet. Thank you, Tom Hall. Um, although 500,000 didn't get listed in that tax rate <laughs> computation sheet, um, we are most likely going to shake out under 5% at this point. Um, you know, again, that's obviously just an estimate. We could do, um, oh, we are 4.75. Look at that. He's great with some, with some right out. Um, 4.75. You know, that, that's, that's not out of the realm of necessary. Um, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, we're still a community that needs to function. So with that, um, the last thought I just wanted to add to is, sorry, I get a little off as the night goes on. Um, I do want to reiterate that we just, you know, overall, we have no authority to, to tell the, you know, the school department how we feel they should or shouldn't find that money. Um, as I stated earlier, I suspect it'll be, you know, with the least harm possible. I'm sure there's a very good chance there might be some more fund balance coming their way. The fiscal year is closing. Um, and I'm also pretty confident that we will get something out of the state, the, the crystal ball and magic number, nobody knows, but, but I think we could be, um, I think we could make the impact minimal and still be respectful to, to those that are hard up and need to pay their tax bill. <laughs> so with that, all those in favor of 500,000, that is unanimous. So back to the main motion, as amended. Any discussion? Tom. Just a closing comment. Um, you know, so uh, um, out of all of those motions, there were two that were passed. Um, the first is being the, um, the issue of any um, excess revenues that come in as a result of this year's budget, and then, of course, the 500000 I'm relying, um, crossing my fingers and toes, because when you add, at least I'm hoping for the six to 700000 the combination of the two, whether it's $1.1 million or $1.1 two or three million dollars, it really takes the entire budget down to a 3.5 percent tax increase, which I think is considerably um, more aligned with at least the outcome of the first referendum. And it's something that um, I think that there is the balance and I really hope that um, while I want to hear about our budget and the reliance on what the $500,000 does, I also hope that our citizenry and our, and <coughs> our constituents also um, apply um, some pressure at the state level so that um, we um, 
um, override any line item veto that may challenge our educational budget as well as our main revenue sharing. That's um, very dependent in this budget's approval. Yeah. Uh, while we won't be doing it this year, uh, if a similar circumstance developed next year where uh, uh, the a high tax impact was going to occur with the school doing its part with uh, uh, maintaining costs, the town doing its part with maintaining costs, but only the school subject to referendum, that the town consider uh, uh, sharing that burden where those circumstances are not within the control of the school. I think the school is being unfairly targeted uh, with this, where the circumstances that are causing the tax increase are substantially <coughs> a, an effect of having good schools uh, and raising your pro the property values of every single person who owns property here in this room. So uh, all those people who have expensive homes, <coughs> why don't you stop and thank the school people for running such an exceptional school? Uh, and next year, I think we probably ought to think about sharing that burden because we are all in this together. Well, the good news is, is it's a two-year budget, so <laughs> yes. hopefully we won't have this pr predicament next year. It would be awful. Anybody else? And all right, well, all those in favor. Is this a roll call vote? Oh. No. Oh, good it's only at the final reading. Oh, oh okay. Oh, so all those at the final reading, it'll be roll oh, call, okay. but tonight it's first reading. So. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Um, give me just a second here. I'm going to take a five minute recess. Sure. Pleasure of the council, would you like a five minute recess? Sure. Okay. So we'll take a five minute recess and reconvene at, sorry, my eyes see right, 8.36. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed everybody's sitting. You're in a coffin set. Yeah. Hey, I knew that was going to happen. Hi. You don't want to shake my hand. Don't worry about that. No, no, no. No, what? I don't want
five that you have before. Right. 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 Yeah, it's All easy. right. And so we should be, I believe we're back. So on to our next item, which is order number 15-049. First reading and refer to the planning board amendments to chapter 405 of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, allowing for food processing facilities within the Highest Parkway Zoning District, HP, and to establish food <coughs> processing facility performance standards. And um, before we take a motion, I, I believe we have some staff here just to kind of introduce this item to us. Hi, staff. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, and Dan Bacon and I are here tonight to introduce a proposed um, update to the zoning ordinance, which would really allow certain types of food processing and food production uses um, along a portion of the Highgate Parkway. Um, I'll be providing some of the background on uh, the ideas behind this uh, suggested change, and Dan's going to take the the harder piece, which is talking about the mechanics of how the zone would, would work and how we're going to achieve certain goals that um, we're talking about. But we both want to state up front, thank you very much to the Long Range Planning Committee and to the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation Board of Directors for their guidance, their deliberations, and their counsel with regard to um, talking through and thinking through the impacts of doing um, uh, these types of amendments. So, you know, as you know, we've, we're always looking at ways to tweak the ordinance to make sure that we're keeping up with um, really current building trends and current demand. And that's really, you know, why it's not a surprise that we're going to come to you and talk a little bit about food production mm -hmm. and where that happens within the town. Um, it's really about how we treat that, this particular use within the current zoning ordinance. You know, the reality is that food production is really becoming a powerhouse um, in terms of an economic sector for this region. The Greater Portland Council of Governments identified more than 60 food processors in the area, hundreds of home-based businesses, and really a healthy supply of very creative um, craft brewers, which we're all very pleased about. So in light of the growth potential of this industry, um, you know, the re it's really been now designated the Greater Portland Sustainable Food Cluster. And it's received a federal designation that's really intended to help this sector grow. And while this is really macro information level, um, the reality is that both uh, the planning department and SEDCO have really been approached over the last year or so from food processors interested in locating in Scarborough. Um, very preliminary stages. Um, there's been a lot of interest in, in Highgus Parkway, which is really not surprising because Highgus has such great logistics. I mean, the transportation um, advantages of being on Highgus, you know, we can see why that's really attractive to uh, some of the processors. Um, but the reality is you can't do food processing in Highgus Parkway right now. You are relegated to the industrial park. And one of the things we've learned in going through this process is you know, that, that food processing and food production is a very different industry than it was 20 and 50 years ago. Um, so really the question is, um, if we allow high-tech processing and a certain light manufacturing, you know, to happen in the Highgate Parkway, could it not be that there are some food production uses that could meet those same standards? And that's really what we went to the Long Range Planning um, Committee to talk about and think through um, what are the, how would that look like on HIGAS. Um, so they've been taking a look at that really for, you know, I'm going to say the better part of a year off and on looking at food production. So I'm really going to let Dan talk now about the specifics of the zone and why we chose certain um, approaches to doing, to looking at uh, processing. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Dan Bacon, <coughs> Planning Director, and to kind of to piggyback on Karen's introduction, uh, the Long Range Planning Committee spent a considerable amount of time thinking about this and, and talking about whether food processing should be allowed in, in all of Highgate Parkway or a more limited area. And after a fair amount of discussion and some consultation with um, both a kind of a working group that we met with as well as commercial brokers that deal in this industry. <coughs> um, the decision was made to, um, with these amendments, propose this, this use um, to be allowed on the southern part of Highgate Parkway. 
there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one being is up by exit 42, there's already a fair amount of you know, retail development. That's surely the character of that area right now. Um, and we, we hope that more of that type of development as well as some office and, and other high-end development occurs there. So that area is likely to continue to grow in that way. Um, and the southern part of Haggis Parkway has more kind of standalone properties um, that, <coughs> that have wetlands, that have buffers in between them that, that might lend itself better to um, a few different larger processors that want to locate and may not want a neighbor right next door, or may not want to be part of a a multi-building or multi-tenant type uh, development scenario. So I guess I lost the image up there. Um, but in the performance standards that uh, we drafted and provided to you, uh, one of the requirements is to have uh, food processing be kind of limited to the southern part of Haggis Parkway as a starting point. I'll bring up the map in a sec. Um, <laughs> and the other performance standards that are before you in the proposed amendments relate to making sure that this type of use is compatible with other types of development allowed in Haggis Parkway, um, particularly that, that odors be mitigated, um, that there not be um, noise or outdoor storage or things that older processors, as Karen mentioned, may be known for, but, but um, the more contemporary industry is being um, conducted in cleaner facilities, um, buildings are actually being designed to, to have nice facades to, to really represent the image of, of the, um, the various businesses. So um, I think this industry has changed a lot in the last 20 to 30 years um, and can be a much better neighbor and more compatible and higher value type of development that could go in Haggis Parkway as opposed to what many of us think of as food processors back um, many years ago. So the performance standards are structured to to kind of ensure that um, these food processors are of the more contemporary high-tech nature. Um, the exterior building design needs to complement other commercial development and be, um, uh, be attractive, and the, and the planning board is given um, a lot of tools here in terms of requiring buffers and um, ensuring that the use fits in with other commercial and mixed-use development that we're, we're hoping to see on Haggis Parkway. And I'll try to get the map up. So you can <laughs> <laughs> So this is a not so good color. Um, for whatever reason, the monitor is not showing up exactly uh, as it is on the computer screen. But for to get your bearings, um, the southern part of or the bottom part of the screen is is Route One, um, where you see some development along the roadway. The big green roof is Sullivan Tire to kind of get your, mm -hmm. get your bearings. Mm -hmm. um, the road that goes up and down is Haggis Parkway. And the, the red outline is the, what's being considered um, the southern half, so to speak, of, of the Haggis Parkway district, um, where the performance standards would allow for this type of use. Um, and there's six to eight larger parcels in this area if you drive up Haggis Parkway. Um, I think many of you know the Horizon Solutions building that's on mm -hmm. your left yeah. if you say you're headed towards Payne Road. <coughs> um, that's kind of two-thirds of the way up the screen in the, in the red, that, that developed site that you see there. So across the street from, um, from that business and, and a little bit north and south would be where the Long Range Planning Committee is recommending. And it's, um, again, it's an area that um, has some developable land, but then also has a fair amount of wooded area that could create some building sites that aren't necessarily um, closely located to, neighbor to neighboring building sites. Thank you. Um, you had a question? Yeah, um, so I just want to make sure I understand the map. So what's outlined in red on the screen above, that's the entire Higgins Parkway zone, correct? That is, no. I, I'll go to the next map, which you'll have. Um, this is the entire Haggis Parkway, and for whatever reason, Haggis Parkway is pink uh, on the screen. Um, and so Haggis Parkway goes from Payne Road, you know, up at the intersection with uh, Payne Road, all the way down to a little bit south of Scotto Hill Road. So if we go back to this red outline that I was showing you, um, this is 
really only the southern half of what is zoned Haggis Parkway. Um, from roughly the ponds where Ingleside's uh, property is, uh, those ponds and the new climbing gym, that's, climbing gym. that's uh, almost complete. Roughly from, from the climbing gym is sort of on the northern edge of this red area down um, to pretty close to Route 1. Um, and your next order, your next item is a zoning map change which would add one more parcel to the Haggis Parkway that kind of completes um, this map. So in this map, if I can extend my question mm -hmm. if you don't mind, in this map um, are we suggesting that anywhere within this, um, this diagram here is where the, um, this, these changes would be allowed? It's not restricted within that map, it's anywhere? Anywhere within this area. Okay. Food processing right. would be an additional use that could be okay. um, applied for in the Haggis Parkway in addition to all the other things that are allowed no, that, there. I um, was looking at what was provided in the package and I was concerned because this is little, um, the next item has this B3 and I thought that might have been where it was being restricted to and I was going to be like, <coughs> that's an awfully small area in the southern part of the zone. Right. So, but I like, uh, thank you. Yeah, I just had a comment. Uh, Dan, am I correct that uh, paragraph M2, performance standards, uh, subparagraph 1, food processing is located within 2,250 feet of the center point of Scott o Hill Road and Hagas Parkway. Yes. Is that being used <coughs> as the description? That is the description of where they can go, and we've because that's not very useful um, in terms of understanding on the face of the earth where that is, this map is trying to show the parcels that fall within that description. Uh, Follow-up question. Mm -hmm. the, the way it's defined uh, is that it's circular. It's a circle Thank you. because it says it's 2,250 feet at all points right. oh, yeah. from a center point of a roadway intersection. So. It doesn't match up with this. I thought it was a novel way of of outlining and defining a zoning district, but I don't think it works at all. I think you would need to have language that uses perhaps more traditional ways of defining the actual <coughs> district so as not to create a conflict between the map that is going to accompany the the narrative, the, lang the the text. So that was that was my one reaction, and just looking at it the way a lawyer would look at it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's two qualifying things. You have to be in the highest Parkway district, number one, and then you have to be within that distance. So I guess the map is in a circle in that there are on um, other sides of the center point there are other zoning districts that don't allow the use. Um, so that's, it, it is an interesting way of defining where it should go um, and interesting way to limit an area within Haggis Parkway to allow it. It was trying to avoid right. a separate zoning district on a map that the only difference is, is one use and that's So and you could it. clarify it right by the food processing that should, should be located exclusively within the HP district within 2,250. Right. So perhaps, yeah. Because I at didn't it. try to tie those two together right. from the uh, uh, introductory paragraph to the subparagraph. Right. But I see how that would work. Right. It's, it's also not an allowed use in the neighboring zones. But I think we can right. work on improving that. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions, Dan? Oh, I didn't have a question. I just had a comment. So okay. Well, give, give me just one, yeah. one moment. Um, so at this point, we do need to take some public comment. If anybody's interested, in I know our room cleared out, but um, is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? All right. And seeing none, um, we do need a motion. So moved. Second. And discussion comments. Kate. Yeah. I just want to say, I feel like I say this every time we have these things come up, but um, kudos to you. I think any time that we're um, using that term more, trying to be more business friendly, I love that term because I'm, I just think it's so critical. Um, I think it's critical to something that we just got done discussing 
Uh, we need, desperately need more ways to bring money into this town besides taxing um, our residents. Um, and I think um, you're hitting the nail on the head. There are so many places now that are, like you, many of the things that you mentioned, I actually know two girlfriends that have opened bakeries that are, are in desperate need of more space. And um, so I think those are great things to add to that area that are simple things. Um, they're not eyesores. They're not, um, like Dan said, there's, there's plenty of places for them to be in there where you're not going to smell bad things. Um, and so I think that's all benefits to us. And so I, I commend you for finding another, another area and another, another way to use Hagus Parkway um, because that, is, uh, that area is in desperate need of, of more stuff. Am I? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm on the Long Range Planning Committee, and uh, <coughs> now I'm not going to be able to talk. <coughs> but there was a lot of interest in that meeting from the people who were there. I wish I could talk more about it, but I'm not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, anybody else? <coughs> and don't. Uh, it, it seems to me, and, and I wanted to know uh, if Karen uh, had a comment on this, uh, that uh, this rezoning may create a strip planning strategy for the Arctic Conference uh, that is now going to be hosted by the City of Portland a uh, year, year and a half from now, and I thought there was some opportunities that you might have started to contemplate. Absolutely. In fact, um, a little bit off subject, but um, the, the idea of, of the food processing, food production sector, it is one of those uh, three sectors that we are working on with um, communities in the Greater Portland Economic Development Corporation. Um, we've got some uh, additional funds to do business development um, from an international perspective. And there is this goal of creating 25% or increasing food production by 25%. And working with the Arctic Council, um, there's this opportunity uh, to bring in and really begin to develop the international business portion of that. Um, and it relates to us having the um, shipping operation from IMSKIP and as an entire region, uh, food production really could be a, a great advantage for us. Um, with IMSKIP, with the Arctic Conference, bringing people from um, 20 different countries will be coming here in October of 2016 and it's going to be an incredible opportunity for us. I, I, I was thinking that, that I've got a, a, a daughter-in-law who's the editor of a food magazine, a national food magazine, and she said Portland is really uh, a, a place that's being more and more recognized as a food city. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, it, and it seemed to me that there was not just food processing, but business offices of food-related organizations that, that they're, they, they are looking for a space that is close to Einskip's industrial mm -hmm. facilities at the waterfront, Absolutely. 15 minutes away. Mm -hmm. So, Right, right. And Scarborough has uh, um, you know, great access both to the the Port of Portland, but also to all of those businesses that are shipping product down to Boston for right. further distribution. Um, you know, we, we certainly understand why they're coming to us. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just a, it's an opportunity, and if we can do this without uh, increasing negative impacts on the community, it's a great opportunity for us. Anybody else? All right. Well, um, make it quick. Love the idea of a brewery. Uh, I do yep. believe you said something about tours, right? So, yep. No, you said something about tours. <laughs> all right. Um, all those in favor? And that is unanimous on to our next item, which ties to our last item. Order number 15-050, first reading and refer to the Planning Board amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map and to adjust the boundary of the Haggis Parkway zoning district. And does anybody wish to speak on this matter? And seeing none, I will close comment. And um, pleasure with the council. So moved. Second. And 
And any other questions are we relating? This is, again, just to kind of recap, is about um, just changing our zone map, the tangible map. Um, so, you know, discussion? All right, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Next item is order number 15-051, act on the request to ratify the collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Scarborough and the Scarborough Police Benevolent Association. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this matter? And seeing none, I will close public comment and pleasure of the council. So moved. Second. And any discussion? All right, seeing none, all right, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. On to the next item, order number 15-052, act on an act to authorize the town manager to accept a donation of 20 plus minus acres of land located at 305 Highland Ave from the Maine Turnpike Authority for conservation land and future use of the Eastern Trail. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, I will close comments. And uh, it's, I'm assuming you're standing up because you're just <laughs> rushing to the podium yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so if you would introduce this item for I'm happy us. Happy to. Yep. Um, the town and Main DOT and Eastern Trail uh, Management District have been working for seems like a number of years, <laughs> um, trying to uh, complete the final segment of the Eastern Trail in Scarborough. <coughs> right now, uh, we have a wonderful trail through two thirds of the community, but there's a uh, there's a mile and a half gap that exists between uh, the Nonsuch River to the south and the Wainwright Fields in South Portland to the north. Um, we were lucky enough to get funding for um, build, designing and building the half of that gap, um, 0.8 miles, and it's not easily seen on your uh, screen right now, but from Wainwright Fields down to Pleasant Hill Road, um, from PAX and the council through your budget process um, approved the CIP for the local match. Um, so that's under design and um, we're going through that process, the right-of-way acquisition process, the land acquisition process, and then hope to see construction uh, late, late this year or early next year. Um, the property that's being offered for donation from the Turnpike Authority is in the middle of that <coughs> gap. Um, up on the map, there's you can see a red <coughs> outline that outlines the property. Um, it's main Turnpike land. They created wetlands there um, for in exchange for mitigation for actually building the jet port interchange back in the late 90s. Um, they've completed their obligations for creating wetlands. It's now basically conservation land. And um, we've asked for the right to build trails through the property and they've said, well, we'll not only give you rights, we'll give you the land uh, to make it a simpler process. So that's really why this is before us. Um, it, it would it make it give the town and DOT more flexibility as to building the trail, maintaining the trail in the future, and those types of things. And they're done with using um, the property. And what we need to do is um, be able to build the trail in a few different locations and just leave alone the rest of the land. So that's why it's being um, um, offered to the community to, to help with uh, the overall trail effort. Very cool. Thank you, Dan. Um, any questions? Any comments? Any? All right. So, um, all those in favor? We need a motion. Oh, <laughs> I'm just ready to. Can I have a motion, please? Move approval. Oh, so I thought I did a motion. Uh, that was in the last. Sorry, I. Uh, we're good. Well, we're been rattling them off. So, um, without any um, discussion, now that we have a motion, <laughs> I think it's just a wonderful thing. It's, I think it's a great thing. All right, and um, so all those in favor, and that is unanimous. On to the next item, which is order number 15-053, act to certify the results of the June 9th, 2015 school budget validation referendum. And um, anybody wish to speak on this? Saying <laughs> none, close comment, and pleasure of the council. <coughs> so moved. Second. Second. And discussion. It is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So not much uh, we can do. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Our next item was our add in fifteen dash five zero four, which was move approval on the request to set on the request to set the date, time and location of the school budget validation referendum as noted on the warrant. 
and oh, I can. Uh, okay. Oh wait, no, I named just <laughs> discombobulated. Sorry. Thank you. Try that again. Yeah. Look at the back. Look at the back. There's the belt. That's the belt. Uh, the date is being offered July 7th, Tuesday. The polls will open at 7 a.m., close at 8 p.m. It will be here at the Municipal Building. <coughs> and, Terry, if you wouldn't mind, also, um, and well, let me get a motion yeah. real quick. Um, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. And uh, real quick, if you could just talk to us about the absentee process and when it's available and, and how you can turn it in. Sure. Uh, absentee ballots become available tomorrow. Um, you pick it up, but you can't return it until the 25th, which is by state law. Uh, ballots that are issued prior to the final reading, which is scheduled for the 24th, um, cannot be returned to the clerk until the 25th. Open voting will start the 25th and run through to July 2nd. Um, then we have the closed period where the Friday before and the Monday before the election, you have to have a special circumstance. Mm. Um, there was uh, a lot of confusion on that last election. Right. Mm. Uh, the reasons that you um, have are you have to be absent from the municipality of, of residence unexpectedly. That doesn't mean, well, I'm planning to work, so I, I'm not able to come. That's not an unexpected uh, absence during the entire time of the here. polls are closed. You have a physical disability or you're unable to leave your home or treatment facility due to incapacity or an illness. And for those who have a coastal island ward or precinct, uh, <coughs> those individuals are unable to travel to the polls. So um, the forms will be up online for requesting an absentee ballot. You can call the office. We can take the information over the phone and mail it to you. You can come in and pick it up. Immediate family members can pick up for their significant others. Um, if you um, are leaving the area before open um, voting starts and you do not have someone that is an immediate family member, you can designate a third person to return that ballot for you. However, you do need to put that name on the form. So. Else? Thank you very much, Tony, for, for en enlightening. I, think I just wanted to point out uh, one of the unfortunate consequences of, of having this um, mm -hmm. July 7th is that uh, Tony and her staff will need to be open on July 3rd, which is a recognized holiday for mm -hmm. staff. Mm -hmm. uh, election law requires that the, that the polls be open on that day, so town hall will be open quite quiet other than the town clerk's office. I assure you we'll make arrangements to make certain they have a day off of their choosing in the future, but yeah. unfortunately they will have to be here that day. I was going to say the same thing as you. Yeah. Maybe a nice person could buy them lunch, Tom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe the whole council could go in on that. Yeah, I think the council could. Can I say uh, something real quick? Too? Sure. I think all the things that Tody listed off pretty much ensure that there's literally no reason why someone cannot vote in this election. I don't think there is any reason someone could come, could come up with why they cannot vote on this. It's an important thing, and I think um, there's just I can't imagine any reason why you could not vote after all of the things that this town offers <coughs> for people to do. Um, William? Uh, Bill? Uh, the clerk's office took some real uh, abuse uh, from people who wanted to vote on the Friday mm. and the Monday before the election. Yeah. Uh, and that was because those people have been led to believe that there were unrestricted rights to vote on those right. days. And state law does not permit the town clerk to uh, have an open-ended policy of early voting <coughs> on the Friday and the Monday. Right. So please do not disseminate information that would let a person believe anything other than there are some significant restrictions on your right to early voting on the Friday and the Monday before uh, the Tuesday election. Can, can I ask a question, mm -hmm. Judy? Uh, what would be the penalty if, if we somehow violated, like if you had accepted, is there some kind of a... Well, when you sign the special circumstance form, you're signing it under uh, penalty of law. Okay. And for us, it's very hard when... Um, 
We can report individuals to mm -hmm. the Secretary of State's office that um, we know we've heard in line saying, well, I'm just going to check off the first box. We could technically oh. turn those people in. Mm. Uh, I didn't know we that. have not. We probably should. But um, so there is a, I think it's a Class D crime. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, and, and the penalties are listed right on our wall <coughs> in the office. Yeah. yeah. I knew there were so many election laws. Mm. Um, John? Um, <coughs> two items that I wanted to um, ask. One is a friendly note. In the, uh, uh, the paragraph after mentioning the police chief's name, it's, um, there's a misspelled word for school. Okay, thank you. Um, and then secondarily, I just I do want to ask, because if it's uh, someone else sees this, I assume that in the school budget validation referendum question number one, the amount gets inserted somewhere in there based no. upon? No, the state, the state mandates what the wording of the question is. Okay, so, so on this, because... <coughs> I'm trying to remember when I voted. So on the first one, did we have the number in, or no. it's not? It's whatever. Not on there. Oh, okay. I just, we all do right. place the notice of summary that the school board supplies us. We do put those in the booth for people. Oh, okay. For all the right. voters to. Just wanted to ask. Yeah. Thank you. Another important oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean. So um, this has to deal more with the time, um, and th what I mean by the time is really the date of the actual warrant, um, so or the date of the election. So. Um, we originally had some conversations maybe um, outside of council chambers about having this on June 30th rather than the 7th, which was more appealing for me. And the reason is because really after July 4th, you run that risk of really having um, somewhat of an exodus of citizens in, um, in some demographic areas um, because of the summer schedule. Um, I'm willing to uh, support, and I think that um, having more time to disseminate the information is obviously <coughs> valuable. Um, but it also stresses that everyone needs to be aware that while we have very busy lives, we have a, not only a right but a responsibility to vote every chance we can because that's what our veterans um, have given us um, through their service. Um, and I did want to mention that because um, we've received some criticism about that schedule um, and other people knowing what that schedule may have been. And I think it's important to note that um, in this year, the time between the first reading and um, um, the first election or the first referendum, there was 69 days total in that process to allow greater transparency. And really um, now with this date that we're setting, there's really approximately 27 days. <coughs> this is probably in comparison to at least um, last year, um, more days in that entire process than was undertaken last year. Last year there was only 68 days between um, the first um, um, reading and then the failure and then the second passing um, of that. So um, for anyone who wishes to criticize that we have not offered enough time to understand what we're dealing with, I think is a very false um, assumption. Um, and even if you look and go back to since 2008, which was the first time in which we started that referendum process, I mean, in 2008, which passed on the first reading, it took 22 days for us to pass it. In 2009, it was 19 days. 2010, it did not pass on the first reading, but the total number of days was actually only 61 days um, for the two referendums. 2011 was 34 days for the total. So I believe we're doing our due diligence. I believe that we're being extremely open and transparent um, in this process. And, um, you know, I think it, what it comes down to, and I've mentioned this, um, that's going to be repeated, I'm sure, since it was to a reporter. I think the criticism is more about playing politics. And um, the fact is that this shouldn't be political. It's about what's best for the community and the process that we're being part of that. And so um, I do hope that people recognize the time frame <laughs> that we've taken and the due diligence that we've given. Anybody else? All right, time for me to chime in again. Uh, I did discuss the timetable um, as far as um, the town staff and, and to send out, and we did circulate around. Um, you know, certainly, I know I, I, I appreciate uh, Councillor Babon's comments and, and um, I thank him for all the numbers. You're our numbers guy. Um, I guess I would just like to, there's nothing malicious about the date that was set. Um, sure. You know, and, and honestly, it's probably my own mistake that I didn't particularly think about the time. I know one of the concerns was the media wouldn't be able to have time enough to run, you know, a second story. <coughs> so that, that thought did not particularly cross my mind. 
Um, so I'm more than happy. We have um, in front of us that moves the date out a week. Um, I will say I'm not comfortable moving that date any further than that because the farther we go into summer, the more you know family vacations and, and those sorts of things and events, and, and, and the more uh, we we have a hard enough time getting people to show up and vote that you know I wouldn't want to make it any more difficult. So um, with that, all those in favor, and that is. Unanimous. Uh, that is unanimous. Chambers. <laughs> item number eight, non-action item. We have none. Item number nine, standing and special committee reports. John Babine. Um, sure. So just some quick updates. Uh, Sedco has their meeting tomorrow. I believe it's at 7:30. It might be 8 o'clock. I have to confirm that. I've been sick for a while. Eco Maine has their annual meeting tomorrow. Um, it starts um, actually there is an executive committee meeting at 11, but the annual meeting starts at 11:30. I did want to mention um, while it is their annual meeting that um, there is some transition for Scarborough. I wanted to congratulate and thank uh, Mike Shaw, our public works director, who sits as a um, board member with myself, who is being nominated to serve as secretary of the um, of the uh, Eco Maine Board of Directors, and I'll be moving into his slot on the executive committee uh, to represent Scarborough. So I want to thank him for his service and his leadership in doing that. And I did want to mention uh, regarding finance, we do have some items that we wanted to consider um, dealing with some scheduling issues myself, but I hope that everyone understands that really the most important issue that we're faced with right now is the referendum question and dealing with the outcomes of both the referendum and then also the state budget. And that really should be our focus until that is settled. Um, and I'll go into uh, reasons for uh, scheduling conflicts at a later time, but I uh, really do appreciate the other members, and if it's something that becomes more urgent, um, if I need to be absent, I hope the chair, um, who's an ex-officio member, can sit in for me, and mm -hmm. maybe one of the other members can serve as a temporary chair person at that time. Bill? Yeah. Yeah, good. Jim Ray? I don't dare talk. Okay. Uh, 7.30. Okay. Yeah. Ed? No committee. Peter? Nothing all right, real quick. All right. Um, Housing Alliance has a meeting Thursday, uh, this coming Thursday on 6:18 at 6:30 p.m. Um, some exciting happy news. Habitat for Han Humanities project is green light go with their 13 lot single family homes. And um, they have a groundbreaking ceremony scheduled for Thursday, June 25th at 9 a.m., which I will be there with my shovel. Um, real quick, historic preservation. Um, two quick notes. Thank you for um, supporting and passing the nominations. Now there is a quorum for them to start meeting. Um, so um, we will work with Tody to shoot something out and schedule a meeting um, just to kind of quick regroup for July. Um, and one last thing to maybe report for historic preservation, the powder post beetle problem in the Hunnewell mm -hmm. House has its next scheduled treatment for June 16th. <coughs> Um, so hopefully all goes well, and it'll be right. open the 18th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that 18th. happened yesterday, and it should be oh, yeah. available is, yeah. tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> there it is. Hello. Town manager report. You stole one of my items, so I'm down to one. Okay. Simply, I want to remind the community that the annual concerts in the park, this is a collaborative effort through the Scarborough Chamber and Community Services, starts uh, Thursday, June 25, and runs every Thursday, uh, <coughs> six Thursdays. Mm -hmm ending on June 30th. So it's well publicized. If you're interested in a particular band, come out for a free event. And council member comments? We'll start on the other end. Peter. Yeah, I mean, our, our, our audience here is kind of left, but hopefully there's still some people <laughs> listening from home. Um, just want to take a moment. I think you, you've heard us reference this is a really tough time of year budget, and it really has been a really divisive issue for our community, but I do want to call out something. Hopefully other council members or other elected officials will say something. There is there is a, a, our, a constituent in our community um, that does frequently address the council. He does so, or the person does so, in a very respectful way, um, but states a point of view. Unfortunately, in the past week, just before the election, someone left a bag of fecal material in his mailbox, and I just find, as a community, that just seems really unfortunate that that's what we're doing. So if anybody knows anything about it, someone out there probably may know who it is. It would be great if you know, you maybe talk to that person, but I think we as a community need to say it's okay for people to have different points of view and not try to intimidate them and do other things. I think it just reflects poorly on all of us. So 
I hope whoever was responsible will think about it. I hope anybody that is aware of who it may be will step forward, but it's just unfortunate those things happen. Mm -hmm. Ed. No comments. Okay. No. I'd like to say more than <laughs> just a couple of uh, notes that I took. Um, I know there's been a lot of people seem to think we we should head, it sounds like, and maybe I'm misinterpreting this, towards a town meeting style of government, which, you know, regretfully, that doesn't work in a town of 20,000 people. Um, so um, I'd, I'd like to disabuse people that uh, saw it. Yeah, go back to town meetings. Um, <clears throat> also, I know Bill spoke eloquently to this, and I know others have too, but, you know, with this whole tax issue, uh, we really need to find some tax support for those who are struggling with taxes, um, the elderly, low-income, disabled, whomever. I know that um, we've done some work in the past, have run into uh, brick walls with the uh, state, and the way the state has their rules structured, um, but that doesn't mean maybe we can get back together and get creative about it. I know I offered to the, I think it was the Concerned Taxpayers of Scarborough, um, I offered to meet with anyone at any time um, if they have some ideas of things that we could be pursuing um, other than just, you know, going after the budget and zero increases in budgets and so it doesn't become so awful <laughs> uh, this time of year. Uh, but I'd love to hear some ideas from folks, so, you know, Put them out there. Email me. Email all of us. So that's it. So uh, I skipped over I skipped over the uh, committee report, so I don't really have counselor comments. But I will give everyone a quick update on the rules uh, and policies committee did meet. We're off and running uh, on the uh, uh, whole issue of better guidelines or improved guidelines for. Uh, distributing uh, uh, funds to public nonprofit in, uh, entities. I think we all agreed that there is a place for this in town, but that we need to create uh, a better method of analysis and that uh, the Finance Committee may not be the best entity to do that because they are so absorbed in their process that it might be, you know, uh, an administrative uh, process. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, so we're off and running with that. We're planning to uh, have a discussion with the United Way on their needs analysis and methodology because they're pretty sophisticated. So we might be able to learn something. So we've got a kind of a framework to move forward. Uh, it was a good first meeting. It was long, but I thought it was a good discussion. And so we really did kick it off. Uh, the uh, Energy <coughs> Committee met this morning uh, and really focused on this uh, pay as you throw. We had Mike Shaw in, Tom there, uh, and it was a lengthy meeting also to, to discuss the merits of it and get the Energy Committee up to speed on that. Uh, I think people recognize that uh, it's going to be difficult to find good solutions and that it may be kind of a fool's errand, but we're not ready to say that right off the bat. Uh, <laughs> we're certainly going to look at the, gar the uh, uh, garbage, oh, yeah. wet, uh, you know, garbage to, gar to garden, uh, and, and we compost it, are both entities that go around and actually pick up uh, uh, composted material or that's uh, uh, available for com uh, composting. Uh, and so we're, uh, we're working on that, and I think we're going to work hard on that probably right through the summer, uh, into the fall, but because there are so many things the Energy Committee has on its plate, We've got uh, the uh, Trigen project wrapping up this summer. will be in place by the fall. The pads are out there. The equipment is, uh, has arrived in Portland. So a lot going on that when we looked at the agenda of items, we said we've really got to get going and just uh, and make some hard calls on, on the, uh, the trash uh, disposal problem and what kind of things we could recommend as an energy committee. Thank you. A uh, couple of items. First, uh, I really want to thank uh, my uh, co-counselors and peers on this uh, on the committee, as well as the citizens who were here and were able to speak. I think tonight we had a very 
thoughtful beginning dialogue about where we want to um, take our school budget next. Um, I don't necessarily know if we have uh, come to a final solution regarding that. And I do believe that we'll definitely, uh, because of, um, to some extent, uh, I think that the comments were rather toned um, and not necessarily fully expressed, but I'm sure that within the next week, um, we'll hear more of that. Um, and, um, you know, we're always open and always uh, welcome that. Um, um, it's going to be interesting, I think, to hear how our comments have been perceived as well as received and then to listen to the criticism because, you know, one of the things that has been absolutely true has been, um, I think, that um, I truly believe that every counselor and every school board member has attempted to um, be neighborly, have been um, truly uh, meaningful in their statements and some of the responses or some of the comments that we're receiving, and I can attest to this personally, um, is just an absolute um, level of disrespect that is unnecessary. So when we talked in our, um, talked in our workshop about uh, the diversity or the division that has occurred in our community, I believe that um, um, you know, we need to look at the root cause of what that is, and I think that there's enough um, blame to go around to all of us, that there isn't any particular constituency, there isn't any particular group um, we all contribute to that, including some of the personal statements that are flat out, um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm being nice to say disrespectful. There's other words that I can choose, but I won't. Um, and people expecting, and, and I'll, I'll be point blank, telling me that it's my responsibility to explain what my family circumstances are in this town and um, why I'm even sitting on this council having served on the school board before. And um, I think that um, that is the level of intolerance that we need to speak up against. Um, I also want to thank um, the chairwoman and the manager, and particularly, um, and I forgot his name already, the police sergeant that dealt with um, what I'll just simply call a speaker's disruptions. Um, you know, personally, even though he asked, um, I think, a good question, I don't believe it's the councilwoman's um, or council chairperson's responsibility to advise um, speakers of what our council rules are. It's our, their responsibility to understand what our rules are and to respect them and to follow the proper decorum because um, having a little bit of understanding with um, at least what was being spoken, <coughs> there's just some things that can't be discussed in public whether it's a free speech issue or not because it can deal with employees. Um, and um, there needs to be something done ar around this particular in individual to the extent that we can and I don't know what that is especially given he isn't a member of or a citizen of Scarborough. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate a couple of things regarding the state budget and the comment I made earlier. Um, I really hope that people investigate what happened last evening with the budget vote because there is still a lot of work ahead in advocacy. Um, it's really important to understand that the homestead exemption, which impacts a lot of Scarborough citizens, um, did remain within um, intact um, and had a little bit of um, spreading out. So that's a very important item that impacts so many people. Um, as we mentioned earlier, educational spending, the increase over the governor's original proposal was $40 million in each of the given years, which is a, a nice move forward. Um, and then the main revenue sharing survived, I guarantee it did not um, increase, but at least survived at its current level. And I'm a little dyslexic, so I can't remember if it was $65.2 million per year, 62 .5. but $62.5 <laughs> million, so thank you. Um, but at least we have some comfort in understanding where the revenue sources are. So. I know that um, in one of our conversations I had mentioned that there was a lot of uncertainty and I think that this budget that has been approved um, thus far provides a lot of greater certainty so long as it can survive the line items as well as um, any veto um, challenge that happens. And I really do hope that not only as counselors but as a community we do thank Senator Volk who spoke up in the Senate chambers and voted unanimously to support it as well as Representative Vashon. Um, we can all be very ideological and very um, much, uh, uh, for lack of a better explanation, pound our chest and stick to our guns on what we believe in. And it took a lot of courage, I think, to find the compromise that was needed in passing the budget. <laughs> and I really want to thank them both for being able to uh, see through that. And I, I just want to end by saying, you know, I feel very, very strongly about the comments when we talk about the advocacy because somehow we've placed blame in some sense <coughs> that the school board is the advocates for our students and they promote what they need. Well, we're the advocates for the town as a whole, and we should be advocating very strongly with our elected officials at all levels, not just state level, but federal, um, when revenue sources are being taken away from us and when policies are being changed that impact our citizens. 
That is our job and our responsibility. And while it may have been a political statement, when I ran for office, I said my campaign was kind of like, um, I think it was uh, people first and Scarborough always. I will always fight to make sure that Scarborough gets what it deserves because it contributes a lot um, to the entire state and we deserve just as much as any other community. While I totally understand the challenges the state has, um, we have a responsibility to, um, to advocate for that support here locally as well. <clears throat> Well, I don't know how I'm going to follow. <laughs> um, I'll try to make mine, mine quick. Um, I was just trying to run down a few things that I had taken notes on from, from comments earlier tonight. Um, I, I, there was a gentleman that spoke earlier about the potential of a 3% tax cap. That's certainly, you know, an interesting concept that I myself have kind of toyed around. You know, how do you bring stability? How do you, you know, you know, there would be some some major changes that would need to take place. It doesn't mean they're not insurmountable, but um, it's not quite as simple as just saying here's the cap. Um, there'd have to be a change to the referendum process and you know some state statutes. But um, certainly it's it's you know pursuable. Um, especially for reaching out to our legislators and, and saying, you know, could you sponsor this? You know, certainly Scarborough was big and didn't have to consolidate, um, so may, maybe we can do something with that. Um, do you want to talk about um, touching base again on um, an earlier theme about being a compromise, um, and, and some of the earlier, to, um, some of the other discussion earlier from some of the other counselors about um, some of the inappropriate behavior that, that's floating around out there. Um, I, I do hope that we can, again, a, as a community, kind of come together and pull together a little bit. Um, we, we, we can't just stand here and argue and, and scream at each other. That, that doesn't get us anywhere. Um, I'm, I, my heart did go out to um, the resident that, that had the um, on a, on a, on a, uh, an unfortunate surprise while getting their mail, um, completely uncalled for and, and unnecessary. Uh, everyone is entitled to their opinion. You may not need, you know, agree with it, but you know, be the adult, respectfully walk away, and just, you know, don't, you know, agree to disagree. Um, as far as um, one other note, I did want to say um, I, I, I've heard it a couple times, and I do just want to make a note: what we bring to the voters. Um, and what we will pass to the voters at second reading is their operating budget. And, and I have heard something that comes up quite a bit is, you know, pull the laptops out or this or that. Um, that segment isn't in the operating budget. So um, just for everyone to be aware that, you know, if you're voting no because you're disgruntled about the laptops, that's not even part of what you're voting on. Um, so just, you know, again, you know, I appreciate that maybe you're not happy with it, but. Um, there's nothing to do with that operating budget. Um, then, um, God bless Sean that you tried to touch on Mr. Doyle. Um, I'll have no comments from, from myself, but um, thank you for, for your support. And with that, on to item number 12, which is adjournment. So moved. Second. All those in favor? And please vote. Sign the warrant. Yeah,